different hearts, different dreams. Injective souls ignite the beams. No dream alone, no path ignored. Surjective wills knock every door. More hearts to thrive, or more dreams to grow. Two mighty sets now march toward battle. The wings of cardinality raise us high to the heaven of infinity. Be Previously, we have introduced the concepts of injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity, and have illustrated these properties by a series of examples. In this section, we discuss how to prove these properties for a given function rigorously. Recall the graph of the Joukowsky function in the first quadrant. It looks like the logo of Nike. When x is less than 1, the function is strictly decreasing and it tends to infinity as x approaches 0. When x is greater than 1, the function is strictly increasing, and it tends to infinity as x tends to infinity. The minimum 2 is achieved at x equals 1. From the graph, we can observe that function is a bijection from the interval 1 to positive infinity on to the interval 2 to positive infinity, a statement that we proceed to prove right now. First, we discuss injectivity. To prove that a function f from a to b is injective, we start by letting x1 and x2 be two arbitrary elements in the domain such that fx1 is equal to fx2, and aim to show from there that x1 is equal to x2. Note that this is the contrapositive formulation of the original definition for injectivity. We prefer this version because it gives us an equation to begin with, which is often more concrete and easier to manipulate than an inequality. The steps in between vary from case to case and can be technical, but the overall framework is essentially the same. To apply the above frame to the function under investigation, let x1, x2 be two numbers greater than or equal to 1, such that fx1 equals fx2. By the definition of the function, we see that x1 plus 1 over x1 is equal to x2 plus 1 over x2. Since x1 and x2 are non-zero, multiply x1, x2 on both hand sides and simplify the equation. We come up with x1 minus x2 multiplying 1 minus x1, x2 equals zero. Thus we have two cases. If x1 minus x2 vanishes, then it implies that x1 equals x2 and we are done. Otherwise, the product x1, x2 is equal to one. In this case, since x1 and x2 are both at least one, so is their product. Thus the product is equal to 1 only if each factor is equal to 1, which in turn implies again that x1 is equal to x2. We conclude that x1 and x2 are identical in either case. This proves the injectivity. Next, we discuss the proof of surjectivity via its definition. To this end, we begin by letting y be an arbitrary element in the codomain b, and we aim to find an appropriate candidate x such that f x equals y. This is usually done through a two-step reverse engineering process. First, we treat y as a given constant and x as the unknown, and from there we solve the equation f x equals y to find x. Second, we check that the resulting x indeed belongs to a. We remind the audience that if we skip the second step, we run the risk of proposing a solution that does not lie in the domain, thus violating the definition of surjectivity. The above process can be reserved for your rough work on scratch paper. In your written proof, you may directly state the value of x you have chosen for a given y. Now, using the prototype, we work on our example. To show the function is surjective, let y be an arbitrary real number greater than or equal to 2. We pick x to be y plus the square root of y squared minus 4, divided by 2. Note that since y is greater than or equal to 2, y squared is greater than or equal to 4, thus x is well defined. Moreover, since the square root is non-negative, x is greater than or equal to y divided by 2, which is in turn greater than or equal to 1. This ensures that x is in the desired domain. Next, a routine computation verifies that fx equals y. Indeed, by the definition, fx is equal to x plus 1 over x. 
plug in the specified x and rationalize the denominator of the second term by multiplying above and below its rational conjugate, y minus the square root of y squared minus 4. We see that the remaining two square roots cancel each other out, leaving us with one half y plus one half y, which is precisely y, and we are done. But how did we find this specific x? Indeed, as mentioned before, to find the appropriate x, we regard y as a given constant and solve the equation fx equals y. Since x is non-zero, we multiply both sides by x, so that the equation becomes quadratic. The quadratic formula then provides two real roots, y plus or minus the square root of y squared minus 4 over 2. Be careful. One of these solutions lies to the left of x equals 1, and thus falls outside the domain, so it must be dropped. The remaining solution is therefore our unique ideal candidate. To prove that a function is bijective, the argument is typically divided into two parts, one establishing injectivity and the other establishing surjectivity. Once both properties have been verified, the proof is complete. Accordingly, we will not repeat those details here. You should now be familiar with how to prove injectivity, surjectivity and bijectivity using their definitions. In practice, the technical work needed may vary dramatically by function, and the definitions may be more or less convenient depending on the case. For this reason, it is useful to develop equivalent criteria that provide greater flexibility. We will explore these in the next section. Shinla Tensei